Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark. We're in Nehemiah chapter 10. We're uh, going to be starting verse 36 this lesson. We're going to be finishing chapter 10 this lesson also. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, in verse 36, we're going to see the dedication of the firstborn. And it says here, also, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the first uh, uh, firstlings of our herds and of our flocks, to bring to the house of our God unto the priests that minister in the house of our God. Now, the dedication of the firstborn according to the law is seen in Exodus 13 verses 2 and 12, Leviticus 27 verses 26 and 27, and Numbers 18 verse 15. Now, this law of the firstborn was all goes all the way back to Exodus. The firstborn of Israel was spared because they placed the blood, uh, they placed the blood on the door of their homes. So back in Exodus, when God was getting to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, God told Moses to tell the children of Israel, get a lamb without blemish. You have to kill the lamb catch the blood, and then take the, that night, take, take some hyssop and stick it in the blood and strike the lintel and the two side posts, make sure you put blood on it, and then go inside and eat the lamb and stay there. Don't come out until the morning. Don't, don't even open the door to, <laughs> don't even open the door to see what's going on out there. No, no. You were to shut the door and stay there until the next day, until the morning. And the death angel would come and he would see the blood and he'd pass over. And your firstborn was spared, was saved. Now, because of that, because of that, uh, the, the children of Israel owed their firstborn to God. Because God spared their firstborn, therefore, down through uh, Israel's history, they were supposed to give their firstborn to God for temple service, temples, temp, uh, priests and things to serve in the temple. But eventually, God appointed the Levites to be his full-time servants and priests. So what about the firstborns of the other tribes? So originally, this firstborn uh, dedication unto God was for all the tribes of Israel. If you got married and, and your wife got pregnant, then she was, and, and, and the firstborn was a son. That son was to be given and dedicated to the, semp to the temple for service unto God. And therefore, uh, then later on, God said, I'm going to, I'm going to change it. I'm going to have only the tribe of Levi be my servants in the temple. So you say, well, okay, what about, what about the, the firstborns of the other tribes? What happens to them? Well, in Exodus chapter 18, verses 14 to 16, God said that the firstborn of the other tribes could be redeemed for five shekels of silver. So after God established the Levites to be his specific servants in the temple, if you were of the tri tribe of Dan or Naphtali or Simeon or any of the other tribes, and you got married and your wife gets pregnant and she has a son, you have to go to the temple 
and you have to buy your son back from the temple service five shekels, five shekels of silver. <laughs> so you go there and you give the, you present your son there to the temple and you give the priest or the priest or the Levites five shekels of silver. And when you do that, you can take your son back home. The, the priest, I'm sorry, the parents could buy their son back to be with them at their home. But this law, this law did not apply to the firstborn of the Levites because they were already obligated to be God's full-time priests and servants. So it only applied to the other 11 tribes. Now in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 33, Jesus himself was redeemed by Mary and Joseph. Now, verses 37 and 38 say, and that we should bring our first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of all manner of trees, of wine and of oil, unto the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites, that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. And the priests, the sons of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes unto the house of our God, to the chambers unto the treasury house. Now, as these Levites, as these Levites received tithes from the people, from the other 11 tribes, as the, as the other 11 tribes brought their tithes to the house of God, they would in turn pay tithes to the priests. Now, remember, priests, Priests are descendants specifically of Aaron. Levites are descendants from Levi. You may say, but I thought Aaron was a descendant of Levi. Yes, Aaron is a descendant of Levi. So, all the priests are only descendants from, from Aaron. That's it. All of Levi's other descendants are considered priests. I'm sorry, are, are considered Levites. So you have Levites and you have priests. They're all coming from, from Levi himself. And uh, Levi, uh, priests and Levites basically are cousins. That's what they're cut. They're cousins. Now, if you'd like a, a little more detailed explanation of the difference between priests and Levites, you can go uh, to Ezra chapter 6, verse 20 uh, on my uh, YouTube channel on that, what I taught on that. And it gives a more, a more, a little more detailed explanation of the difference between the priests and the Levites. Remember, they're all of the same family. They're all coming from the tribe of Levi. But it's just that God specifically said, I want Aaron's sons to be the priests. Everyone else from Levi is going to be, is going to be servants, Levites, uh, temple servants. The Levites were basically the, the priests' cousins. And that's true. They were, they were cousins. Now, let's finish in verse 39. And it says, for the children of Israel, and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn of the new wine and the oil unto the chambers where are the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister and the porters and the singers and we will not forsake the house of our God. Now it says here, the very last part says, and we will not forsake the house of our God. Now, 
this is what this is what this whole covenant this whole covenant written here in chapter 10 is all about this is why they're this is why they're writing this covenant unto God is that they will not they're dedicating themselves to not forsake the house of God before the Babylonian captivity the temple served as a sedative to the sinful Jewish people. They went to church. They did their duties. Then they lived their sinful lives uh, the rest of the week. And you know what? That kind of thing sounds just like a lot like people that go to church today. They go to church and they, they feel holy or whatever, but the rest of the week, you know, they, they live their sinful lives unto themselves, not unto God. But these people here approach the temple and God's service with their whole heart. They come to God with a fresh heart, not with a familiar heart. But if we remember... Only about 70 years earlier than this, in Ezra chapter 6, verses 15 to 23, when the temple was finished, these Jews that were fresh out of 70 years of captivity had the same excitement to follow the law. So you got the same dilemma. About, about 70, I'm uh, sorry, um, about 60, about 75 years earlier, these, these, uh, the Jews that came back with Zerubbabel to Jerusalem to build the temple, they came back and they built the temple. They finished it. They dedicated the temple. And then they, then they had, they offered, uh, they had the Passover, uh, service there and, and everything seems to be back with God there they seem to be have a fresh start and yet 60 years later here they are intermarrying with people they're the the priests and the Levites the heads of of the families of the tribes they're 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 into sin again and, and it's just a terrible thing and it's only 60 years since since then and now it's another 15 years later and here they are, they're dedicating themselves unto God, saying, we will not forsake the house of our God. And, and, you know, our hearts are sinful and deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Only God can know it. Only God can know our heart. You know, we may have a desire to serve God uh, our whole life. But only God knows the wickedness and the sinfulness of our own heart, the deception of our own hearts toward ourselves too. It doesn't take long for the sinful human heart to go astray from God and from his ways. It doesn't, it doesn't take long. We can get all excited and, you know, I'm back with God now and I'm, I'm, I'm gung ho for him. I'm going to start reading my Bible and, and maybe, and maybe, you know, you do. You do start reading and start praying again, but our heart, there's no, there's no guarantee. There's many pastors, many leaders in, in Christian community fall by the wayside and they start good and they look good and things are going fine. And, you know, they got hundreds of people following them and they got a big church or a big Bible study, or they got, you know, uh, things going on here and there and, Things are, wow, I wish I was like them. And we get all puffed up, you know, and wow, I wish uh, we envy them and think, you know, boy, I wish I could pray like they pray. And then five, six years, seven years later, they're gone. They're gone. Why? Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Only God can know it. We have to be careful. Uh, you know, we can we can launch up to up to heaven all kinds of promises and dedications and all that stuff that we want. But but our hearts are deceitful. We have to be humble before God every day 
We have to draw life from him every day. Because if we don't, our hearts, are, our hearts are right there to deceive us. I'm telling you, your heart is deceitful. It'll, it'll, it's right there. It's every single day. It's nagging and nagging and nagging to draw you away from God, draw you away from prayer, from his word. And we may, we may puff out our chest and say, I'm going to, I'm going to do this for God. And, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be a great servant for God and all these things. Yeah. yeah. And about five months later, you're out back into the world again. Why? Because we can't, we can't, can't take the pressures of this life. The thing is going on. No, we need to humble ourselves unto him. We need to stay, stay humble before God. And, and make his word our priority in prayer. We're going to continue on these lessons in chapter 11, next lesson. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.